So the definition of heat transfer, that's our first step, right? What is heat transfer? So heat transfer is the exchange of thermal energy between two systems due to a temperature gradient. Okay, so we need to have a temperature gradient for heat transfer to occur. That's our driving force. If you don't have a delta T, you don't have heat transfer, okay? So driving force, delta T, heat transfer occurs between two systems at different temperatures, right? Um, then the next question you might ask is, what is the difference between heat transfer and thermodynamics? Well, thermodynamics study a system at equilibrium. So here will be thermal. Uh, we have in this point of equilibrium thermodynamics. And heat transfer studies all the way to reach equilibrium, okay? So a system in not equilibrium, that is what we are going to study. As an example, uh, in thermal, we study how much energy we need to put into a system to reach certain point, like boiling temperature. And in heat transfer, we are going to determine how much time it takes us to reach the boiling point, okay? So that's the main difference between heat transfer and thermal. So heat transfer we have here, the rate, right? right, Like the way to reach the point of equilibrium that we study in thermodynamics. That's a big difference. So how many modes of heat transfer then we have? We have three main modes of heat transfer, conduction, convection, and radiation. Conduction happens by direct contact. Like when you touch a hot mug of coffee directly, right? You can, you can sense that heat transfer. Or like I have in here, when you touch a hot pot, right? By contact, very important, contact. Convection is a heat transfer by fluid motion. Um, and we have here two types of convection heat transfer. One is forced convection that happened by external means. That is when we are moving our fluid with a fan or a pump, right? That is typically what we do in engineering, right? We move fluids through pumps. Um, the other type of convection is natural convection. And this happens by buoyancy. This we see a lot of in nature and also when we are heating water, for example, imagine you have a pot, right? And in the bottom of the pot, the water start coming hot, right? Here, and it is colder on the top, right? So then the hot water moves to the top because there's a difference in density, right? So that is natural convection. And radiation, finally, that is the third mode of heat transfer is a heat transfer by electromagnetic waves. And you can feel that when you stand up in front of a fire or outside in the sunlight, right? Sunlight or stand in front of a fire. So pretty simple, right? We all identify those three modes. However, um, what is the main function of heat transfer? Well, heat transfer help us to estimate cost. That's pretty important. It help us to understand the feasibility of the process and it help us to size equipment and it's what we are going to do. We are going to size heat exchangers, okay? So those are the main functions or the main, um, the main um, outcomes that we can uh, determine through a heat transfer analysis. But it is very important to have in, in mind at this point that convection doesn't happen by itself. Conduction doesn't happen by itself. And radiation doesn't happen by itself. Typically in real life, phenomena happen all together, okay? Conduction and convection can be important and you need to include them in your cost analysis or in your uh, design of equipment. Or maybe radiation becomes important. So you cannot disregard, okay? You cannot say, okay, I'm just going to evaluate this equipment or the cost of this equipment just in terms of conduction.
you need to evaluate which ones are important and add the contributions of two or the three heat exchangers, heat, uh, heat transfer modes, sorry. Okay, and as an example, um, pretty simple, a coffee mug. That is something that you can see every day. In a coffee mug, we can see conduction, convection and radiation all together, right? Conduction between the interface of the coffee mug and if you put it on top of a table, right? Because it's a solid. Convection between the coffee and the mug wall because you have a fluid here involved. Conduction through the wall of the mug because it's a solid. And convection and radiation might be important from the mug wall to the surroundings. Either conduction of convection here. Meaning of conduction. Well, conduction is nothing more than the molecule vibration and movement of free electrons of molecule in contact. Contact is very important. And actually to evaluate conduction, we need to evaluate the cross-sectional area. That's why I mark it in here. Very important, there's no bulk motion. And all the time the energy transfer occurs from more energetic particles to less energetic particles. That means from hot to cold. Very important. Um, conduction typically occurs in solids or fluids at rest. And mathematically, how we describe conduction? Well, we use Fourier law to describe conduction. Very important equation, Fourier law. And in order to develop the Fourier law, we need to imagine that we have this slab, right? This slab that I have here, right? It has cert certain cross-sectional area, marked there in green, right? We have two different temperatures, one in this wall, another one in this wall, denoted by T1 and T2. And um, our profile of temperature can be sensed in the thickness of our slab, that is delta X. So heat transfer by conduction is proportional to the cross-sectional area, the gradient of temperature or our driving force divided by dx or the thickness of the slab that we define it in here. Since we want to remove this proportionality uh, symbol, right? We need to introduce a constant and this constant is K, the thermal conductivity, area dt over dx. We have a minus sign here in the equation if you compare to the equation I write in here. Why? Because we have a negative slope in here and to maintain the positive heat transfer rate due to the difference of temperature. However, if you remove that sign, you just have to be very sure that your difference of temperatures is always hot minus cold over delta X. where the Q is heat transfer rate, K is the thermal conductivity that we introduced to remove our proportionality constant. A is the area perpendicular to the direction of heat transfer or the cross-sectional area that I marked here for you in green. T is the temperature and delta X is the thickness. If we want to calculate the heat flux, we just divide the heat transfer rate by the area. Uh, very important, as you can see, an important concept or um, yeah, concept that we need to revise is that here we have delta T's or gradients of temperature, right? So when we have a gradient, gradient of temperature, one Kelvin equals one Celsius and one uh, Kelvin equals 1.8 rankings. So you don't have to do the conversion of the whole temperature, right? It's a gradient. Is something that you study in your Felder textbook elements 
of chemical engineering. So gradients, we don't have to do all the temperature conversion because it's not a point. Remember, a temperature can be a point, but a temperature can be also be a gradient. If it is a point, yes, you have to do, for example, to change Celsius to Kelvin, Celsius plus 273 because it's a point. But if it is a gradient, one Celsius equals one Kelvin. So don't forget that important concept because sometimes I have seen that you go through all the pain <laughs> of doing the whole conversion right for a gradient and uh, that can save you time. Well, the next question would be, what is that K? What is the thermal conductivity, right? I can know the temperatures because I can go and measure them. The thickness, I know the geometry, right? Of the equipment or whatever I'm evaluating, but what is the thermal conductivity? What is K? So K is a property of the material, very important. And it indicates the amount of heat that flows per unit time across a unit area when the temperature gradient is a unit. And the units of thermal conductivity then based on that definition is watts per meter Celsius or BTU hour feet Fahrenheit, right? And what does thermal conductivity means? So it can tell us how a material behaves, if it behaves as a conductor or as an insulator. So typically, if we have very high values of K, like in copper, for example, that you can see it has a K value or thermal conductivity value of 385 watt meter Celsius, that means we are dealing with a conductor, okay? And when we have in very low values of K, like for the case of cork, that is 0 0.07 watt meter Celsius, that means we are dealing with an insulator. So the K value can tell us uh, how the material behaves, it's a, if as a conductor or a, as an insulator. However, very important, there's not a number established, okay? You cannot say, oh, from 200 up, you are dealing with a conductor. From 10 down, you are dealing with an insulator, okay? It can give you an idea, only an idea, okay? There's no established value for that. Uh, the K value depends on the temperature, like you can see in this plot, right? Is the variation of thermal conductivity uh, with respect of the temperature. And you have some plots like this in your textbook. Actually, you have figures 1.7 and 1.8 in page 18 and 19 of the eighth edition, where you can find graphs like this. But for simplicity in this textbook, we are going to consider that K is going to be constant, behaving constant. And then you can go to the tables in the back of your book to read the thermal conductivity for the materials you are dealing with and apply the Fourier equation, okay? Uh, you have tables in appendix two. So you can refer to appendix two for these tables. And you have tables uh, 25 to 27 for different materials, a whole range of materials. So you can read K values from appendix two. No? So pretty easy, let's go through our first example so we can uh, use Fourier law. Uh, the cost of heat loss through a roof. So if you can start reading the problem, we have um, the roof of an electrically heated home is six meter long eight meter wide and 0.25 meter thick. And it's made of a flat layer of concrete whose thermal conductivity is 0.8. Um, the temperatures of the inner and outer surfaces of the roof one night are measured to be 15 and four. Like you can see, everything is here in the little drawing there to your right, respectively for a period of 10 hours. Determine the rate of heat loss to the roof that night and the cost of that heat loss to the homeowner if the electricity costs 0 0.08 cents per kilowatt hour. So to solve the first one, you can start solving Fourier law. Hot minus cold, right? Uh, we need to calculate this area is what we will be missing here. We have the thermal conductivity, we have the two temperatures. Um, what else? We have the thickness. So how much is the heat transfer by conduction?
<laughs> That's fine. He's trying to survey by conduction. This time I have to put it like a small fuel sorry. Key. Yeah. Mm, I got or 1.69 kilowatts. So then if I multiply those kilowatts by the 10 hours that I want to evaluate the period of time. Yeah, I get the energy, right? Kilowatt hours. And if I multiply that energy for the unit cost, that is 0 0.08 cents per kilowatt hour, I can get how much it costs him to keep cool down his, um, um, to keep cool his roof. It was $1.35. Just check that it's just the roof. It's a very simplified problem, right? We're just considering the roof. It would be $1.35. So let's move um, to convection. So convection is a heat transfer mode uh, between a solid surface and a liquid or a fluid. It can be a liquid or a gas that is in motion. And I already uh, mentioned that we have two types of convection. We have force and we have natural. And in general, the faster the fluid, the greater the convection heat transfer. That's why in engineering we use pumps, right? Because we, we need things to happen fast, right? Especially in industry, we cannot wait for stuff happening just by itself. So we can have forced convection. And as you can see here by this little drawing, in forced convection, the fluid is forced to flow over the surface by external means. That means the fan, the pump, or the wind. We can have also natural convection. And in here, the fluid motion is caused by buoyancy forces that are induced by differences of densities in the fluid, right? Like I already explained when you heat a liquid in a pot, right? You have a den density change, then there's a fluid motion, okay? Very small, but there's the fluid motion, um, not as in forced convection when we have the pump. Um, how can we describe um, convection? Well, convection can be described by Newton's cooling law, okay? So Newton's cooling law is Fourier to conduction, okay? So Newton's cooling law is nothing more than heat transfer rate equals to the convective heat transfer coefficient area over the, which the heat transfer occurs as the interface between the solid and the fluid because it's where we are evaluating the heat transfer in this case, right? We say that in convection, heat transfer occurs between the interface of a solid and a fluid, right? So in this case, it's the area where the convective heat transfer occurs. PW is the temperature at the wall. And also your textbook or other textbooks can be used instead of T wall, TS for T surface. Just to denote we are dealing with a wall, a surface, a solid, okay? and uh, T infinity is the temperature of the free stream or the surrounding temperatures. Again, for heat flux, divide by the area. So here, um, what will be the complication? We can measure the area where our heat transfer is occurring. We can know the wall temperature, right? And we can measure the temperature of our fluid. So these are knowns. What would be here the complication? How to get the convective heat transfer coefficient, right? And what is H, first of all? What is that convective heat transfer coefficient? 
Well, the convective heat transfer coefficient we introduced in uh, Newton's cooling law to remove again the proportionality constant, right? But as a difference to the thermal conductivity, the convective heat transfer coefficient is not a property of the fluid. It should determine experimentally and depends of several variables, several variables that you already studied in your fluid mechanic course, such as the nature of the fluid motion, the bulk fluid velocity, and the surface geometry, okay? Um, right now, as you can see in my syllabus, we will be focusing on conduction first. After completing conduction, we will be focusing on convection. So for now, in this first part of the course, I will provide you the H values. So the H values are going to be constant for now. Once we focus on convection, fully on convection, you need to learn how to determine the H value. So at that point, we are going to go through a review on fluid mechanics because you need to uh, recall uh, velocity boundary layers, the Reynolds numbers limits, viscosity, all that kind of terms we need to recall in order to determine convective heat transfer coefficients, okay? For now, I'm going to give those values to you to solve problems. So don't worry for now. Um, units of the convective heat transfer coefficient, international watt meter square Celsius, English BTU hour feet square Fahrenheit. We will be keep using in this course English units a lot. Why? Because heat exchangers, most of the theory of heat exchangers was developed in England. And then most of the tables, rules of thumb, etc., are in English units. So we will keep using both parallelly, both international and English units. 